now going to turn our attention back to the Arab-Israeli conflict. We had left off with the 1948 Arab-Israeli War, which ended up with Israel receiving most of Palestine, taking almost 75% of that area, which was a lot more than what the UN had been willing to give them in the original partition plan. From that point on in 1948, there was issues between the Arabs and the Israelis. Um, the Arab refugee issue was a constant point of contention. But at least things were not blowing up in actual conflict in the years between 1948. But that was to change with an issue called the Suez Crisis, which broke out in 1956. And it basically has its roots back to 1954, when a man by the name of Gamal Abdul Nasser became the Egyptian Prime Minister. He was definitely against any type of colonial influence, not just in his country, but in the entire Arab world as well. He saw himself as the leader of Arab nationalism and basically wanted to do whatever it took to get the Arab world free from foreign, inter foreign intervention and control, especially his own country of Egypt. However, there were some issues that were happening as the Cold War was unfolding that influenced Nasser's de decision-making process. In 1950, there was an agreement between Britain, France, and the U.S. to limit arms shipments to I Egypt and Israel in order to minimize the Arab-Israeli conflict. And this was only two years after the Arab-Israeli War in 1948. And so at that point, Nasser had not become the Prime Minister yet of Egypt. But this would be something that would influence uh, a request that he made to the U.S. later on. Also, we know that the Korean War had erupted, and along with that, something called the Radford Plan. If you look at the top of 120 in your Paper 1 book, basically it was a decision made by the National Security Council along with the Joint Chiefs of Staff in our country to reduce the level of U.S. troops deployed overseas and replace them with local forces supported militarily by the U.S. in order to be a deterrent to the Soviet Union. So this would minimize our involvement directly in other countries, but we could still be indirectly involved by supporting uh, locals within these countries. Also, with Eisenhower coming to the presidency, which I discussed in the last recording about the Korean War, there was definite change to how foreign policy was being approached in our country. Truman had initiated the Truman Doctrine, which said that communism was going to be contained. At that time that he issued it, it was directly geared towards Europe. However, at this point, there had been issues in Asia, such as with Korea, and also now here in the Middle East, that meant that the, the means of carrying out the Truman Doctrine would have to be looked at and reviewed. And the Eisenhower administration decided instead to shift our emphasis and to try to put a ring around the Soviet Union by establishing treaties with countries that were on the southern borders of the Soviet Union. And that would effectively close the Soviets in and prevent any type of expansion of communism to outside countries. These countries that were on the southern parts of the Soviet Union, a lot of them were in the Arab world and were seen as strategically important for us because of things like the oil issue. Other things happened that set the Arab world in the midst of the Cold War, such as Turkey joining NATO in 1952. Along with that, CETA, which you can see in the sidebar on 120, and it was also at the end of the Korean War um, in the Cold War book discussed, it stands for Southeast Asia Treaty Organization, and it's basically the same thing as NATO except for the region of Southeast Asia. And it was established at the time of the Korean War because of the expansion of communism with what had happened in China with Mao's revolution and because of the North Korean attack on South Korea, which didn't succeed in taking over the whole peninsula, but it was the threat of it that prompted the creation of this organization. At the same time that the Korean War ended, the Vietnamese were in the process of expelling the French from their country. The French had been the colonial power over Vietnam for quite some time. And these people inside the country saw this as their opportunity to break free from that control. So the idea of communism spreading to other parts of Asia became a serious concern. So as the Cold War was progressing, the role of the Middle East was going to become an even greater area of concern for the Soviets and the Soviet Union. Obviously, the Middle East would be seen as a, a key region where Soviet influence could continue to grow if we didn't watch it and try to contain it. Eisenhower's Secretary of State, I introduced him in the last recording about Korea as well, was named John Foster Dulles, and he was definitely a hardliner when it came to um, anti-communism. He wanted to definitely make the statement that we were standing up to and not only containing communism, he was in favor of rolling back communism and liberating countries that had been in communist control, such as in Eastern Europe. That never really materialized, but the ideas of being more aggressive to communism's expansion 
was definitely initiated with um, Dulles and Eisenhower in office in Washington. Dulles came up with this concept of a northern tier, which is where the countries that were on the southern border of the Soviet Union and the northern border of the Arab world um, would be supported by western countries, obviously like the United States, with the same type of philosophy as NATO and CETO, which we militarily built up these countries in an alliance so that they would be protected by us if there was an attack or a threat of an attack on them. Obviously, Nasser, who had just come to power in 1954, which was shortly after the election of Eisenhower and him coming into office, being that he saw himself a leader of Arab nationalism, did not want the U.S. to gain a stronghold in the region of the Middle East. And so because he realized that the U.S. was trying to do this, he wanted to reach out to other nations to ally with instead of the U.S., which obviously would turn more to the direction of the Soviet Union. In this time period of the early 50s, Eisenhower had sent CIA forces into Iran and also in other countries such as Guatemala, but Iran being in the region of the Middle East uh, was something that was troubling to Nasser. The fact that we had helped stage an overthrow of the Shah and were doing it for our interests worried Nasser. The U.S. had also signed agreements with the countries of Turkey and Pakistan, which also lay in the Middle East. So Nasser did not want to see the U.S. The US develop a very strong influence in the Middle East because he wanted Arab nationalism um, to make a, a strong statement and be seen as uh, a key player in the world scene. At the same time, the British, even though they were closely allied with the United States, did not want our country to replace their own influence. They had had interests in the Middle East and influence there for decades and did not want to give that up. Even though they knew they were a second-ranked power at this point after World War II, they did not want to completely lose their grips that they had still in the Middle East um, and in the oil revenues that went with that. The Baghdad Pact was signed, you can see that on the sidebar on 120 as well, which included the countries of Great Britain, Turkey, Iran, Iraq, and Pakistan. Some of these nations had been mandated countries of Great Britain after World War I, such as the country of Iraq. And these countries came together to sign an agreement to consolidate Britain's position in the Middle East. Later, this would be known as the Central Treaty Organization, or CENTO, in 1959. I think pretty much these countries went along with Britain because they saw benefits for themselves in the long run if they allied with the British position. So let's see how Nasser's thought process and decision-making decision unfolded from this point on. When the Baghdad Pact was signed, it infuriated him. It was signed in 1955, which was just the year after he came to power as the prime minister in Egypt. And basically, he was very upset at, specifically, Iraq's leader, a man by the name of Nouri al-Said, which you can see him on 121 of your paper one book. He saw this man as a sellout to Arab nationalism and basically uh, was furious that the interests that he was trying to promote with uh, the Arab world were being threatened by this guy. Again, Nasser saw himself as the leader of Arab nationalism and didn't want any of the Arab countries to be making agreements with any Western countries or any countries that could be colonial powers. There were some actions that Nasser took to try to promote the idea of Arab nationalism, and that's a lot, in a lot of ways directed against the newly established state of Israel. Because Egypt and Israel share a border um, through the Sinai Peninsula, and there had been an area gained by Egypt at the end of the 1948 Arab-Israeli war called the Gaza Strip, there was some things that Nasser could do to hinder the progress of the Israelis. So one thing that he did was institute a blockade of Israeli shipping through the Suez Canal and a blockade of all goods being shipped to Israel from other countries that used the Suez Canal. He began inspecting Israeli ships. At one point, he even tried to ban any type of overnight flights from Israel going into other countries to try to hinder the progress of the Israelis. At the same time, as Nasser was trying to make life difficult for Israel, the Palestinian Arabs, who many of these had been expelled at the end of the 1948 war, were starting to become better organized. They organized themselves into guerrilla units called Fedayeen, which you can see the definition of that at the bottom of 121 in your sidebar on the Paper 1 book. And so what they would try to do was carry out raids and strategic attacks on Israeli positions. Obviously, Israel wasn't going to just sit back and let this happen. They took a very hard-line approach against these guerrilla units and created their own called Unit 101, which was to strike back in retaliation to these attacks by the Fedayeens. There was one particular attack that was made that really uh, 
set the relationship between Egypt and Israel in a bad direction. It occurred in the Jordanian village of Kibya, and it was in October of 1953 after an attack on um, Israel that killed a mother and her, chi and her children. This particular raid in Kibya saw the deaths of 69 people, and most of them were women and children. It was strongly condemned by the United States and obviously Arab countries, and it started a deterioration between the relationship of Egypt and Israel, which was fragile at best at this point because of some of the actions that Nasser was taking up here. Israel was particularly worried that the British troops that were stationed in the Suez Canal, which was kind of like a buffer zone between Egypt and Israel, and it was a major passage route for shipping and trade. The lease on the canal was about to be up, and the British had, and the French, who created the company that created the canal, had control of the lease, and it was about to run out, and Israel was worried that this could threaten the security of their newly formed state. In February of 1955, things continued to unfold in a negative direction. There were increasing raids in the Gaza Strip, which was the area that Egypt had received after the 1948 war. Hostility rising. You can see this mentioned at the top of 122 in your Paper 1 book. Um, both Israelis and Egyptians were killed in these raids, and so Israel wanted to make a statement that they were militarily capable of handling these attacks against them. There was one particular strike on February 28th where 38 people were killed, and it was sent as a message to Nasser and to the Western countries that Israel would and could maintain itself militarily. At the same time, Nasser was becoming more hostile towards Israel. He was openly supporting the Fayadian attacks, which were those guerrilla attacks on Israeli positions. Um, but I think that he realized he also needed the support of other countries to try to eliminate Israel as a threat to Arab nationalism. So interestingly, he asked the United States to supply Egypt with weapons to defend itself against Israel. And because we had made that limitation agreement back in 1950, Eisenhower refused. So that meant Nasser would have to look in other places and made an agreement in September of 1955 with Czechoslovakia, which was an Eastern European satellite of the Soviets. So really you could say that this agreement was with the Soviet Union for massive arms shipment to be sent to Egypt. And you can see how much of that in 122 in the middle. 300 tanks, 200 armored personnel carriers, 200 MiG-15 fighters, and 50 Ilyushin bombers to Egypt. And obviously this scared Israel because the balance of military power would be tipped in the favor of Egypt. So that spurred them into action and made them enter into an arms agreement with France where they would be supplied weaponry. Nasser, ever since he became the Prime Minister of Egypt, had a dream not only to be the leader of Arab nationalism, but to make Egypt a glorious country. Part of that would include the building of a, a big dam on the Nile River at Aswan. This would generate hydroelectric power and provide irrigation to the areas on the Nile River, which would then help Israel in its developments domestically. The cost of this dam was being financed with loans from the World Bank, the United States, and Great Britain. And then unexpectedly, with all of these things happening and unfolding, the U.S. announced that they would not continue to provide any more money for the building of the dam. Britain soon followed this statement by the U.S., and this was a huge blow to Nasser's dreams. If you look at page 122, you can see that this was something that Nasser was going to be hugely upset over and want to retaliate. So therefore what he did was he announced in July of 1956 that the Suez Canal would be nationalized and put under control of the Egyptian government. Therefore all the revenues that were paid when ships passed through the canal would be given to the Egyptian government and not to the British and French controlled company that controlled the Suez Canal at that point. For France, this was the last straw. They did not like Nasser at all, even before this happened, and so now they definitely wanted to go in and depose Nasser. The British were a little bit uncertain because they felt that this could backlash on them because of the reaction of the United Nations to an attack like this. However, the French knew that Israel would support their efforts, and at the end of September of 1956, an agreement was made between the French and the Israelis to try to take action against the Egyptians. So in the next recording, we'll be picking up with how the Suez crisis unfolded from there. But basically, it was Nasser's retaliation to not being provided the funding for the Aswan High Dam that he so desperately wanted to make Egypt into uh, a great country in the Arab world.